pseudo break. Okay, so lecture four three, measuring motor position and velocity. I woke you guys up with the clapping, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. Motor position and angular velocity are best measured by rotational quadrature encoders. Rotational encoders are made from a wheel with alternating dark and light stripes. The encoder we have affixed to the rear shaft of, um, of our motor uh, is an HP, there's the model number, there's the manual, has black stripes on clear plastic. A light source either reflects differently off the stripes or, as in our case, passes the light through the clear plastic wheel into a photodiode or is blocked by the black stripes. So there's, it's all these stripes where it's either passing through or getting blocked, passing through or getting blocked. Each time a stripe passes by, the photodiode detects a blink, which is passed on to the MyRio via digital channels of the MyRio configured for detecting encoder outputs. The encoder pinout is shown in figure 4.4, which is from the manual. Um, and this is how um, we'll be connecting it to uh, the MyRio will be these channels. Quadrature encoders. The only issue remaining is that a given blink doesn't give one important piece of information, which direction the encoder is rotating. You could imagine that it rotates one way, and it's like, you could think of it as being like pizza slices, right? And you got like, instead of getting it reasonably half and half with like, say, mushrooms and no mushrooms, you have every other slice with mushrooms, okay? So say you have a light source that's looking at the no mushrooms, and then, oh, now it's looking at mushrooms, okay? It's looking at the mushroom slice. It knows that the encoder rotated, so the shaft rotated um, by a certain amount, but it doesn't know which direction it rotated because it could be the, the uh, mushroom slice to the left or the mushroom slice to the right. So it doesn't know which direction. So, the idea for determining the direction is a clever technique called quadrature encoding. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. That like, I sounded really sarcastic, but it is actually very clever. Uh, <laughs> uh, the idea is that if we double the number of stripes, but offset the second set by half of a stripe width, then measure both channels A and B, so looking at the one that's half a stripe off as channel A and the other one as channel B. Um, if you're looking at both channels A and B, then the direction can be determined by which channel leads the other. Okay? So for instance, if we look at this figure, then if we have time horizontally, and say this is the channel A is saying, you know, no, there's no uh, uh, stripe. And then channel B is saying there's no stripe. And then you get a little bit further in and channel B is like, oh, seen, seen a, a mushroom stripe here, mushroom pizza. Channel A is still not seeing mushroom. Channel A finally gets to see mushroom. And then channel B still sees it for a half a stripe and then it loses it. Okay, so... This is what we would see if we have, for instance, I mean, it doesn't have to be this way in every situation, but in our case, if uh, uh, channel A is, um, uh, this waveform is said to be leading, A is leading B, is, is, cl is a clockwise rotation. So uh, A leading is being... You can say the pulse looks like it's shifted ahead in time. Um, and uh, counterclockwise is what happens when uh, uh, B is leading A. So B is a little bit ahead of A. So that's, that's a sort of clever technique that we use in quadrature encoding where we say, oh, okay, we can first detect that 
it moved, and then we can detect which direction it moved based on which one's leading the other one. So you can count based on the relative channels. And one of the things that's really nice, so uh, a great many microcontrollers know they're smart. They, they build these microcontrollers, and they know that you're going to want to do stuff with encoders. Okay, So they'll build in special aspects of the microcontroller boards to handle this type of signal coming in, a quadrature encoder signal. And they know that it has to do very fast calculations of this and very fast counting. Otherwise, it's going to be useless to us if we find out that the thing rotated by, you know, two degrees five seconds ago. It's not so useful. So we need to know really quickly when stuff happens. Uh, so we have uh, uh, in the MyRio board, we use actually uh, an FPGA, which is a very, very fast uh, uh, processing unit, which can only do certain types of operations. It's not as general as a microprocessor, um, but it can do them very, very quickly. And it can do them uh, very quickly for the uh, inputs and outputs of the MyRio board, and that's one of the reasons why it's such a powerful board. They can do such good real-time control because it has this FPGA that's helping with the input and output. Um, so we'll have a whole, there's a whole library that interacts with it as an encoder. Uh, um, and you can configure certain digital inputs to be encoder inputs. And it will handle all of the counting for you. Uh, so it's really nice. Uh, we don't have to actually keep track of each each uh, little flash ourselves. Most microcontrollers come with um, little modules that effectively do that for us, and we can just ping it and be like, hey, what's the count? <laughs> what's the count? What's the count? And it'll tell us what the count is. It's pretty sweet. So that's how we keep track of where the motor shaft is, is via quadrature encoders. and. Uh, this is one of the best ways to determine the position of things in a mechanical system is the rotation of a quadrature encoder. You can also do linear quadrature encoding as well. So rotational ones have the advantage that you don't have to have, I mean, if you're moving a long linear distance, you have to have a, the tape unrolled and as long as you're going to go, right? The encoder has to be a lot longer, um, but you can do... You can do uh, uh, quadrature encoding for linear position and for rotational position. And it's one of the more um, effective ways of determining position and inexpensive. OK. Yeah. Uh, so in the, the lab this week, we found the FPGA, whatever it is. Is that using the same processor? So we're going to be using the FPGA for the encoder count. Uh, we're, we're going to be running our main C code, though, on the microprocessor. So the microprocessor is going to interact with the FPGA. Um, we don't have to do a lot of the work in terms of the, the library. Like We don't have to write the code that the FPGA is actually running to keep in track of the of the encoder, um, which is fortunate, but it's common too. We don't usually have to write that code ourselves. Um, on, on some occasions we will, and obviously somebody had to do it. Somebody had to write that code. So, And I'll say that um, having, having an FPGA, I mean, this is, this is not really a lecture about FPGAs, but, but now that we're talking about them, having an FPGA is not common for inexpensive microcontrollers. So inexpensive microcontrollers um, typically would not have a nice Xilinx FPGA on board that could do um, uh, very fast input-output processing. But that's also part of why microcontroller, microcontrollers that can do real-time servo control or, or motor control or position control um, are not cheap. 
um, they're relatively expensive because the hardware is actually more advanced hardware. So, yeah. Um, so a, a, a very cheap microcontroller that you're going to put in, say, a dishwasher. Okay. Don't need an FPGA for that one. Skip the FPGA on that one. But if you need it to do precise positioning control for a robot arm, definitely need that FPGA on there. Or you need some, some, it doesn't always have to be an FPGA, but having those for precise motion control is, is very helpful. Yeah. Then what would you put in the dishwasher? Ah, well, so you can, have a, you can have a small CPU on your board. Um, so microcontroller can can have a small CPU. It can have a little bit of memory. It can have uh, some basic input output. Um, it, it should be able to detect like buttons being pressed, turn on LEDs, that type of thing. So it should have. Typically, it's going to be just digital inputs and outputs. Um, occasionally, you'll need an analog output in a basic one. Uh, but yeah, usually those types of things you can just do with digital inputs and outputs and a, and a basic CPU. So those are a lot less expensive. Yeah. Building up to that, that yeah. if it was like a, a smart dishwasher or something like that, then yeah. would you migrate to an FPGA? Um, probably not. It, really, the only time you need an FPGA is when you're going to do really fast calculations. Oh. So um, even if your microcontroller was going to be like Wi-Fi enabled, which is, you know, that's cool. A lot of like smart stuff is like that now. Uh, it it wouldn't necessarily need to be doing that fast. So, you know, you could connect, you could maybe be pulling down data or pushing up data um, without having to do fast input output. So as long as it's not like real time required stuff, um, there's not really a need for it. It's when you're doing like motion control that's like it has to you know the feedback has to be happening and the output has to be happening now <laughs> that's when you really need those those boards um, so yeah if you can get away with it which you know you always would because it's much cheaper um, wouldn't want to do that so I mean I, and actually even the I mean you can think of if you're familiar with like all the projects that uh, Arduinos are capable of which is a, a great many projects um, they just this last year, I think, introduced the first um, Arduino board that has an FPGA on it. So they didn't have one until like a year ago, and it's pretty it's pretty new. So there are tons of things you can do without having an FPGA, but real-time mechanical control is one of those things that helps a lot if you've got it, um, or something that's a utility for doing quick input-output, encoder counting, that type of thing. So. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop us there.